Welcome, everyone. So delighted that you're here joining us for this fantastic conversation about questions. So I would love to welcome Bob Tidi. Uh, this is a little bit about Bob and myself. And before we get started, there's something really important you need to know. But before I share that with you, Bob, I just wanted to say hello. Thrilled that you're here to join us and so excited about our topic of questions. Donna, I am thrilled to be here too. Honored for the opportunity. I'm seeing the list of all the people joining us. Welcome. Absolutely. For, uh, I want to thank everyone for your questions. Um, just so that you know, um, we'll be capturing that and sharing them back with you because one of the tips we'll be sharing later on is the importance of collecting questions. Before we get started, um, Bob, I'm really excited about something special and we're sharing this at the beginning instead of making everyone wait to the end. Um, within the next couple of months, um, everybody on this webinar will be able to download a copy of your latest ed addition to your collection of resources on questions. So um, any, anything you wanna say real quick, Bob, about this exciting new book? Well, Donna, this will be my, my third uh, book. And just like the previous two, it will be a free ebook. Uh, this one numbers about 200 pages, uh, 25, 26 chapters. And, uh, and every chapter will share a great question along with stories of uh, how, either how I discovered that question or how that question's been used. Uh, the stories make the questions come alive. Yeah. And, and I trust that as you read a chapter, you will be getting up saying, I, I can't read any more. I have to find somebody that I can ask this question to. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob, I'm excited uh, to read the book. And I'm also excited because as a guest on our webinar today, I understand you're going to have a lot of fabulous stories to share with us. Well, I, I, again, I'm honored to be here. So during our conversation today, we're covering these three topics. Um, Bob and I are going to explore the art and a little of the science of asking questions. Then we'll connect with how you can increase your effectiveness. And although we titled the, the webinar that was about leadership, the reality is that asking great questions will make you better in any role, friend, spouse, parent, employee, team member, volunteer, and more, questions always increase effectiveness. And then the third uh, section of our time today, we're going to share a whole bunch of resources from books to toolkits to the launch of the Catalyst question cards. We don't want your learning to end at the conclusion of this webinar. We're lifelong learners, and we're going to share some ideas to help you continue your learning journey. And then at the very end of the webinar, we're going to share some ideas for action and application um, because all the wonderful stories you're going to hear from Bob and the ideas and the information is just that it's information until you apply it. And we want you to get the most out of our time together. And that means putting the information into practice. Uh, Donna, if you could stay on that previous slide just a second. Um, I want to unpack that quote a little bit. Great. Uh, Leadership is not as much about knowing the right answers as it, as it is about knowing the right questions, or I might even say it's just knowing some of the right questions. You know, Donna, for a leader who thinks they need to have all the answers, what an incredible heavy weight is on the shoulder of that leader. And, and the fact is, none of us know all the right answers. But if you feel like you have to be that leader with all the right answers, well, there's times you're going to make up answers. That's true. You know, on the spot. Mm -hmm. but, but to reverse that, just to know it's about asking some of the right questions is so freeing. I mean, it lightens the load for a leader. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one kind of silly question I like to ask leaders is they say, now, if you were in a rowboat, with all of your team, uh, let's say the executive team, your whole team, and there were oars for everyone, and the goal was to get across the lake as fast as possible, how many of them would you like to have row with you? And of course, uh, the answer is always, I'd like everyone to row. <laughs> well, of course, of course. 
And then uh, that's really a setup question for my next question. Why then would you as a leader want to row into the future and you're the only one on the team that has the oar in the water? In other words, you feel like you have to tell the team what the right way to oar into the future for your team is. Why would you not want to turn and access and just like in that boat you're taking advantage of the muscle power of everyone to row why would you not want to access all the brain power of your team by asking them what do you think might be the best way to get across the lake the quickest or you know obviously reach your goals or, or into the future of your company your organization and, uh, you know, said that way, again, it's, it's not a difficult question. It's like, yeah, of course. That's a fabulous story. And Bob, I have a feeling that throughout our conversation today, we're going to be referring back to that. So thanks for sharing that. And I agree. Why would you want to row into the future on your own when you have an amazing team that you can tap into through the power of questions? Amen. All right. So the art of questions. This first segment is about questions and the art of it, but there's a lot of science behind great questions. And Scott and I have been studying conversational intelligence over the last few months and have seen some fascinating neuroscience research that underscores the importance of asking versus telling. And Bob, before we got started today, we were talking about some of that neuroscience and how fascinating it is. So perhaps that'll be the topic of an upcoming webinar. That would be great. But for our time today, as we explore this art of questions, um, Bob, we're going to hear from you as you share your story about why you've become so passionate about great questions. Then we're going to talk about why questions matter and finally, the benefits of questions. So that'll be this particular session, section of our webinar today. So Bob, tell us your story. How did you become so passionate, so fascinated by questions? Well, thanks, Donna. Just a parenthesis, this question, what's your story, is one of my favorite questions, especially with people that I meet for the first time, because everyone has a story. And so I thank you for using that to ask me for my story. Um, Donna, um, I think I want to start with a confession. And uh, someone once said, you know, confession's good for the soul, but bad for the reputation. I I'm going to risk it. <laughs> the reality is that for most of my leadership career, here's my confession, I was a benevolent dictator. Um, the only paradigm of leadership that I had was that leaders, of course, they need to be kind, they need to be appreciative, but leaders need to tell. Leaders need to be directive. Yes, they need to use please and thank you, but it's the job of a leader to tell the team what they need to do. And that was my only paradigm of leadership until 2006 when uh, I was in a bookstore, and my wife loves to go to bookstores. She goes everywhere, but she knows when she's done, she'll find me in the leadership section. And uh, I usually pull off three or four books, peruse them. Uh, sometimes one goes home, sometimes none. But that day, I found the book called Leading with Questions by Dr. Michael Morquart. I only read a few pages and said, this one's going home. And that book was a page turner for me. And uh, I began to teach out of it. But the story of that book, the reason it was a page turner, is Dr. Morcourt, who's become a friend and has said, just call me Mike. In that book, Mike gave me a different paradigm of leadership. I don't think Mike shared the story of the rowboat, but he certainly throughout the book again and again, the principle of why would you want to feel like you need to have all the answers and not ask your staff for their input? And of course, he then began to share the benefit of when you ask staff questions, uh, the benefit of, of they feel valued, they feel ownership, the ideas they come up with, they uh, have a lot of energy then to execute on. And there were just so many things, but that book is such a part of my story. And, uh, and then there's kind of an, another story. Um, I've attended the Willow Creek Leadership Conference many times, 
And uh, a few years back, Liz Wiseman, author of Multipliers, a great book, Multipliers, was uh, one of the speakers. And so in anticipating her, her, uh, her speech, her session, which was also going to be called Multipliers, um, you know, I walked in thinking this is going to be fun because she's going to be speaking down about leaders like me. <laughs> and she started, though, with a term, well, I kind of understood the term, but, but she defined it in a new way. She started with, instead of defining multiplier, she defined what she called diminishers. Mm. And, uh, and the more she talked, the lower in my seat I sank. She said, for example, that when you bring a diminisher leader a problem, they solve it for you. And I thought, well, sure, that's exactly what a good leader will do. And I thought of the time staff brought me problems, and I said, oh, Sally, uh, uh, sit down. Let me tell you what, how you can solve that. And as Sally left, I thought, wow, she is so glad she brought that to Bob because I gave her a perfect recipe for solving it. Liz says that multipliers don't solve problems for their staff. Instead, they say, well, what do you think the solution might be? And they let staff or others, family members, whoever, solve their own problems. So multipliers are question askers. Oh, they are. They are. And, and then the second thing she said is that when you bring a diminisher, an idea, they say, like Donna, great idea. But you know, if you also added this and this and this, it'd be even more fantastic. And again, they don't realize, well, as, and I did that time and time again. Uh, and as staff would leave, I'd think to myself, oh, the Donnas of this world were so glad they brought Bob that idea because I improved it for him. I actually had no self-awareness that, you know, the second or third time Madonna brought me her idea and I added to it, Donna actually left thinking, I'm never bringing Bob another idea because no matter what I ever bring him, it's not good enough. In other words, they weren't appreciative, but I had no, no awareness. And she said that a, that a multiplier hears the idea and says, Donna, great idea. Tell me more. And, uh, you know, when we saw these questions coming in today, I, I just noted that uh, many of our listeners or, you know, participants today, one of their favorite questions is also, please tell me more. And, uh, well, Donna, the longer she talked, the lower I sank in my seat. And, uh, and of course, that too has motivated me to say there is a better way to lead and that is to lead with questions. When a staff brings a problem, Donna, what do you think the solution might be? When a staff member brings an idea, great idea, tell me more. And, uh, and lead with questions instead of being a teller. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing that confession, Bob. And I'm sure everybody in the audience can relate <laughs> in some way to that idea that um, having the answers is what leaders are expected to do when in fact what you just shared the better way to lead is actually leading with questions which happens to be the name of your blog and your website imagine that <laughs> yes imagine that so um, connecting to that so that's really your story and again thanks for sharing so why do questions matter well Donna may I ask you a question Absolutely. And, and there's a lot of answers to why questions matter. And, uh, you know, our participants today, uh, we'd love to hear from them on why they think questions matter. But here's the question I have of you, Donna. Uh, when you've had a, a, a superior, a, a boss, a director, a supervisor, say, Donna, what do you think we ought to do about, and it was some topic related to either an opportunity, a challenge, some issue the company was facing, the organization, how did that make you feel? Hmm. I felt like my voice mattered and that I was being valued. Yeah. Without them saying, Donna, I value you. I, I think you have a lot to offer. Um, just the action of asking for your input 
made you feel valuable. They communicated that they valued you, they appreciated you, they felt like you had a lot to offer. Mm -hmm. And so um, why questions matter? One of the reasons is simply that it affirms staff. Um, my friend uh, Andrew Sobel says that uh, telling creates resistance, questions create relationships. And so asking those questions of people and, and then of course listening creates that relationship. And, uh, and so that's part of how questions matter. That's outstanding, Bob. And so what I just heard in terms of um, why they matter connects directly into um, why they benefit and how they help us. So um, as you mentioned, we'd love to hear from the audience as Bob and I are having this conversation um, about why questions matter and the benefits of questions. So we'd love to hear from all of, all of you out there. How have questions helped you and why do they matter? So we've heard from um, Danielle, questions help overcome assumptions and biases. They create an atmosphere of exchange and trust and demonstrate that you care. So Bob, a lot of the points that you were making, and I love that um, that was shared because isn't it true in today's world where we're trying to increase engagement and overcome bias and build strong teams, questions can be a powerful and pretty inexpensive way to do that. Oh, uh, absolutely. And you know, it's fascinating. The first question on the screen, how have questions helped you? Um, I've got another story. You know, I think at times a great question, uh, I've sometimes said that, you know, questions are, are like uh, keys. They unlock things. Mm. And a great question sometimes unlocks something that's already inside you, but that you've never put together before. Mm -hmm. And um, back in 2003, I stepped away from a role that I'd been in for 24 years. Later that week, I met with a dear friend, and he asked me what I now would say for me has been the best question I've ever been asked. And his question was, you know, you worked with the leader I'd worked with for 24 years. What did you learn from the man? And wow. from the top of my head, I began to answer. And he then said, well, Bob, do you have these written down? I said, well, no. And he said, why not? And I said, because no one has ever asked me this question before. <laughs> and, yes. and he said, well, you need to write these down. And then he said, and you know what else? And I said, what? What else? He said, when you're done, you need to share them with, with you know, the leader I'd worked with for 24 years. He said, mm -hmm. it will bless his heart. Mm -hmm. And at that point, Donna, I went bingo. And he said, bingo. I said, when I stepped away after working with him for 24 years, I wanted to do something to express my appreciation for the 24 years of partnership. Uh, you know, I was thinking, what gift could I give him? And I had a sense that it was not something I could pick up at the mall, but I had <laughs> no idea. And the bingo was, that was the idea. And over the next uh, couple of months, you know, not full time, but daily, I would add to the things that I'd learned. And uh, on Christmas morning, I had that in a printed booklet under his Christmas tree. Um, and, but at any rate, an example of how questions help. They unlock something that I would not have come up with on my own. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And so that connects to a lot of the things that are, um, our participants are sharing. Greg talked about how questions help confirm or confront what I think I know. Excellent. Uh, Danielle, questions spark creativity. Uh, Cassandra says they allow other perspectives to be shown and explored. Um, Christiana, to get more details, to know more about the speaker, and maybe even building on that with another question. David shared um, how questions have helped him is realizing how much and what I don't know about a situation, a topic, or a person. And I love that, that statement because how many times, um, to your point about leading, Bob, where we think we need to have all the answers, whereas when you walk in with questions, it helps you fill in blanks that you may not even realize exist. 
Yeah, a- absolutely. These are great answers. I'm, you know, again, Donna, by us asking these questions, we're learning from uh, all the participants today. And so thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, we're benefiting by asking questions and their responses. So this, <laughs> this kind of demonstrates to all of us, again, the value of asking questions, the ability to learn. Yes, yes. And for all of you who are sharing we would greatly appreciate it if you would share with all panelists and attendees so that your fellow attendees could uh, appreciate the brilliance that you're sharing. Um, So we've got some other responses like encouraging active engagement and promoting deeper thinking, how questions um, help. And I love DG was talking about how he was um, in a situation where his company was offering a buyout And as he was contemplating his next steps, someone asked, what do you want? And exactly your story, Bob, right? Like you were looking, you were looking for a way of appreciating somebody that you'd worked with for all those years. And that question somebody asked just catalyzed and helped you see things in a new way. So fantastic. And keep, keep the responses coming again for all of you out there. We'd love to hear how questions have helped you, why they matter to you. And we're going to talk a little bit about benefits, which we kind of have been doing that already, right? Um, a lot of the, the reasons we ask questions connect directly to the benefits, like engaging the team. So we heard from Kim that that was one of the ways that, that uh, questions are so helpful. And uh, so she talked about questions and role and engage participants. So that's fantastic for team building and also for creating change, right? So whenever we're in the process of, of change, and we are telling people about the change, it's helpful to share information, but imagine if we were to bring some questions so people could engage and get involved. So Bob, what are some other benefits that you see of questions? Well, again, maybe this is a repetition, but when you're asked a great question, it, it unlocks things in you that were already there but often in ways that you've never put together before. Mm-hmm. And, um, and again, we talked about when you're asked a great question by someone, you feel valued, respected, and heard. Um, I also like it that, uh, that sometimes when you ask a great question, it unlocks a memory that you haven't recalled for years. And, and Donna, you don't necessarily need to answer this, but if I said, Donna, take me back to first grade, what do you remember about your first grade class? It might be, Donna, that you haven't thought about being in first grade for years. Mm-hmm. But if you took time to unpack that, it might bring back some great memories. It could bring back a painful memory. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but nevertheless, it might be for many people kind of an interesting thing to to answer because they haven't been there for a long time. And yet there's a file in your brain called first grade. <laughs> mm-hmm. And there's lots of things you actually have in that file. Mm-hmm. Uh, so sometimes it, you know, it takes you back. Uh, I think those are great questions at times that we ask our, our, our mom and dad and grandparents and, and aunts and uncles is asking them questions about the past so that we, you know, even discover more about our present, where we came from by knowing a bit more of their story. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, And and then with staff, asking questions allows them to uh, solve their own problems and to own their decisions. Yeah, that's, that's a really key point, Bob. And Carrie Lee Miller also mentioned that asking questions is a great way to teach Because when someone says something, they believe it better than if you just tell them. Oh, yes. That's so true. And the reality is, um, my number one quote of last year, I heard at a conference, it was Dr. Pita Fuda. And I know, uh, Bob, I shared this with you. I just thought it was so brilliant. It was that people may um, agree with your opinion, but they'll only act on their own opinion. And so everything you were just sharing about feeling valued and respected and heard is all true. And that whole point about insight, when questions create insight, that can lead to action. And so as a leader, that's one of the most essential things, right? We're trying to create change and transformation. And by asking great questions, helping people get the insights themselves, then they're willing to take action. 
Donna, let me share another story on, on uh, that shares another benefit. Um, my, my dear friend, Cheryl Batchelder, former CEO of Popeyes, in her book, Dare to Serve, kind of asked, how well do you know your staff? And then she asked this question, do you know the three or four events that have most shaped their lives? And that has become another one of my favorite questions. They asked somebody, what would you say are the three or four events that have most shaped your life? And when I've, well, every time I ask that question, I learn something often from people that I think I really know well already. Hmm. But when I ask that question, it's like, wow, I learned something I didn't know. One of my, my dear friends, high energy, he's a head of training for a major uh, uh, global company. And I asked them that question, and he said, well, Bob, did you know that uh, many years ago, I was training for the Olympics uh, in track and field, and uh, my stipend had run out, and so I needed to get a job, and I got a job at, at a factory. And just a few days into that experience, a heavy piece of equipment fell to <sighs> me. And uh, for the next five years, I was in and out of the hospital, many surgeries. He said, I still have constant pain. And again, with his high energy, I, I was unaware. And, and he said, most of the people where I work uh, have no idea about this. Hmm. And it was just like, wow, in a few minutes, a relationship that was already good went deeper. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and it also reminded me, Patrick Lencioni wrote the book, uh, Three Signs of a Miserable Job. <laughs> and one of those signs was anonymity. In other words, people that you work with don't know your story. Hmm. They, they don't know the three or four events that have most shaped your life. And, uh, and he makes the point, it's easy to leave a company where they don't know you. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the things as leaders is just asking our staff, finding the time, you know, one-on-one -on -one to ask that question. Donna, what are the three or four events that have most shaped your life? And then, of course, listening. And, and the benefit of that staff member leaving that conversation feeling like my supervisor, my boss, my friend, my colleague really knows me. Yeah. So powerful, Bob. And I love that question, the three to four events, because you're I get tired in networking events <laughs> of that, you know, what do you do question? Like, no, let's let's change that and have a different question. I'd like to know who you are as a human being. So great questions and fantastic comments. Um, I want to share everything everyone's saying, but we need to keep moving along. Um, we're going to step into our second section of the webinar today where we're really connecting um, all that we just shared around why questions matter, the benefit of, quest of questions, to increasing your effectiveness. And I love this because effectiveness is really about whether you're getting the results, the outcomes that you're looking for. And whether you're a leader or any other role that you're in, questions can transform and massively increase that level of effectiveness. And we're going to talk about um, how that can be so. Now, in order to increase your effectiveness with questions, we're going to talk about, first of all, increasing the quantity. So there's two dimensions here in the effectiveness piece, Bob. We're going to talk about quantity and then quality, and then how the three ways how questions increase your leadership effectiveness. So quantity, you had a great story oh, um, right. about um, somebody kind of important who shared with us how to increase the quantity of questions in our daily lives. Yeah, whenever I, I hear this or think about increasing the quantity, uh, Jim Collins, author of Good to Great and How the Ma Mighty Fall, uh, challenges all leaders to double your questions to statements ratio, to, to double it. And my friend Mark Miller, who is a VP of Training and Development at Chick-fil-A, said, uh, you know, several years ago, he was in a meeting with Jim Collins, who challenged him and all the leaders at Chick-fil-A to double their question to statement ratio in 12 months. And then Mark said, and then he said, we should double it again in the next 12 months. Um, and, you know, when we think about that, 
um, I always like to kind of think X to Y. In other words, you may have no clue what your statement to question ratio is right now. And one way to kind of find out is uh, look back through some of your recent emails that you sent to staff or to all your staff and uh, just kind of circle how many statements did you make? How many questions did you ask? That kind of gives you a clue. And, uh, or in your next meeting, you could have someone track how many statements, Donna, did you make in that meeting? How many questions did you ask? And so you kind of get in touch with, right, with what right now might be invisible to you. In other words, I think most of us have never thought about questions to statement ratio, so we really have no clue kind of where we at. But look at some written communications, track it. And then here's another clue of, of going forward is so often, Donna, our statements can be turned into questions, mm. can't they? Yes, they can. <laughs> um, and so uh, there's times I will look at an email that I've just quickly drafted and then say, okay, how can I turn some of these statements into questions? And, and I can. Or uh, another little clue that relates here is, you know, as leaders, we often have to draft agendas for meetings. And the normal agenda, I, I don't know if it's statements, it, it just has topics. Mm -hmm. And an easy way to in increase your questions ratio is to change those topics to questions. Instead of just sales as a topic, you change that to uh, what will it take to increase our sales by 20% hmm. if, if that is kind of the direction you're going. In other words, uh, make the question be relate to the outcome you're looking for from that discussion. But agendas should really be a list of agenda questions. So even in looking at it, you immediately can, can uh, guess not guess, you really have a sense of knowing what the purpose of that uh, agenda item is. Mm -hmm. So just a few ideas there on uh, increase your questions to statement ratio. Excellent, Bob. And I want to connect that to the visual that everybody's looking at. So um, you're probably all familiar with the habit loop that we um, get cues from the world around us that cause us to just step into a routine in order to get a reward. All that's explained further in The Power of Habit and many other great books. The reason I'm sharing that here is because um, Bob gave us some fantastic ideas, right? Like on your next meeting agenda, the cues are generally a list of topics and he's suggesting put questions instead, which the routine of the meeting will get shaken up by, you'll ask more questions because you've given yourself new cues. So the question to all of you is, how can you use cues, change the cues in your life in order to increase the quantity of questions? How do you remind yourself of the importance of questions? So um, just putting it out there for all of you, if you've um, found a technique or a way, like Bob suggested, um, actually beginning with measuring your uh, question to statement ratio and then some other tips or tricks that you can figure out how you can increase your question to uh, statement ratio. So one of the ways that we've found um, to help increase that question ratio question to statement ratio is question cards. And Bob, I know we've talked at various times about collecting questions and you had a fantastic insight here about the, the value of questions. Well, one of the things, you know, if we collected coins, nothing wrong with collecting coins, but Donna, if you had a coin that I wanted, only one of us could actually possess it. Mm -hmm. I could either buy it from you or you could give it to me, but only one of us could possess that coin going forward. You'd either say, nope, it's not for sale and you'd keep it, or uh, you'd offer it to me for a price, I'd pay it and I'd have it. Mm -hmm. But the fabulous thing about questions is, Donna, you can have the great question, share it with me. I get to take it and you keep it too. 
<laughs> and uh, and so I love this hobby. My my lifelong mentor Bob Beal back in 1980 told me he had an unusual hobby. Mm. He said I collect something. Might you guess? Well, I guess stamps and coins and traditional things. And you know, he said no. Nope. He said I collect questions. Mm -hmm. And he was the first one that kind of elevated in my mind the value of questions. That's and, fabulous. Uh, and another great thing about leading with questions, Donna, is our questions don't have to be original. In other words, <laughs> we don't have to have come up with them. Mm -hmm. And Donna, you've shared a little bit here. Tell us more. But you've put together this collection of questions. You've actually created a card deck. I have. And, so and how, many, how many cards in your deck? Well, Bob, the number of questions that you play a game of cards with. So we've got 52 cards. Fabulous. Um, and there's some of our favorite questions. So yes, I am a, collect, a question collector myself. I've got lists and lists of them. But what I found is that there's times where I'm like, I want to remember a question. You know, I'm in a networking situation or I'm sitting in a meeting with somebody and I'm like, I need some good questions. And so flipping back into notebooks that I may or may not have with me was a challenge. And there's incredible books like yours, Bob, um, great books of questions, but I don't always have them with me. So um, what I did was said, huh, what if we were to capture these on cards that you can carry along with you, tuck in your pocket, slip in your um, planning agenda, wh whatever you have with you. And that way you're not being disrespectful in a meeting by pulling up your phone. Because I know there's times where I've done that. I've had them in the notes section of my phone or um, on an app someplace, but actually just be able to pull out that tangible card. So yes, we've created the Catalyst question uh, deck. And whether or not, you know, you can, Absolutely, we'll tell you a little bit more about them. But for all of you, collect questions and capture them on index cards. Use them um, to remind yourself to ask more questions. So that's part of increasing your effectiveness by increasing the quantity of your questions. So collect them, ask them more regularly. And thanks, Miriam. There's a link in your um, chat box if you want to learn more about those Leadership Catalyst question cards. So that's one way of increasing your effectiveness. Then let's talk about quality, Bob. Are all questions created equal? Um, well, we hear at times there are no dumb questions. But uh, my take is uh, sometimes there are dumb questions. And, uh, but on the other hand, well, I guess I'll talk out of both sides of my mouth. I remember going through the uh, Disney uh, uh, leadership the magic behind the Disney leadership tour at Walt Disney World. And they said, you know, uh, you actually have to think when you hear a dumb question, sometimes there actually is an answer. And, and they said, for example, their cast members, uh, all staff at Walt Disney World are called cast members, are sometimes asked, what time is the two o'clock parade? Now, you could think, well, that's a really dumb question. It said two o'clock. But they've trained cast members not to say, well, that's a dumb question. Instead, they will say, depending where at the park they're at, the two o'clock parade will come by here at 2.12. And uh, in other words, they understand the question may be a little deeper. And even though they didn't ask what time does the parade come by here, mm -hmm. they anticipate why it was asked. And, uh, but certainly there are some questions that are better than other questions. Um, Donna, for just a moment, uh, questions that are not that great, but we might, well, Bob is guilty of asking these sometimes, is the leading question, which really is a, a uh, you think you're asking a question, but uh, hey, Donna, don't you think it would be a good idea for you to do <laughs> X. Well, I've really, it's, it's a, maybe a little politer way than saying, Don, I need you to do X, but I've actually hidden a statement within a question. It's a leading question. Right. And, I, uh, that's, and that's dangerous, Bob, because um, and I think you're, you're onto something here that we all want to pay attention to that questions really need to come from that place of curiosity, right? Where you're, gen you're genuinely interested in learning or understanding what that person has to say about whatever it is you're asking about. And when you bury 
um, your intent in a question, we all know it, right? It's, we do. it's almost like you defeat the purpose of the question. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So the leading questions is something to be careful of. And, um, and then also just paying attention to bias in questions because the way in which we ask questions, um, it kind of connects to what you were saying about a leading question. Um, but you know, like that whole funny statement, you know, the morale can, or, well, how, how, how did that go? The beatings will continue until morale improves, you know? <laughs> um, so, so anyhow, um, yeah, we need to be cautious and careful in terms of constructing questions. Uh, and I find that in the leaders that I coach and work with, one of my tips and recommendations is to prepare in advance some questions and whether or not you actually use them, they'll be tuning your brain into the fact that you need to ask questions. So that's why I love having the question collection. I can skim through them and say, you know, are there some appropriate ones and useful ones um, that we can use? And then one of the things David Wong shared is that um, when he finds himself saying the problem or challenge is, um, in kind of making that statement, starting with a, a STEM phrase, how might we? And so that's another thing, in addition to collecting questions, are there some STEM phrases, you know, like tell me more about blah, blah, blah. So there's some things like that that we can incorporate into our conversation that really puts us in a place of curiosity. Well, Donna, I love your phrase that you've uh, suggested, and that is often I will use as a preface to a question. I'll say, you know, Donna, I'm really curious, and then I'll ask the question. And um, it, it's not only a great setup, but it, but it actually helps me as a listener to, if that's really true, then, then I really want to hear your answer. Yes. And, uh, and I'm not asking a leading question generally, you know, I don't generally, we wouldn't put together, Donna, I'm really curious. Don't you think you ought to do what I'm going to suggest? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So I suggest again, in addition to collecting questions, um, pay attention to those little stem phrases that you can just pop on at the beginning of your questions that as Bob said, will help frame it better, put you in that place of curiosity and increase the quality of your questions. Donna, if we can just back up oh, one. Sure. Um, I, I was just thinking too of the why question. We, we often think about is why a great question uh, or is it not? And a, a paradigm that's helped me is that if I'm asking Donna, in other words, a person I'm talking to, the person I'm with, if I say, Donna, why did you do that? Mm -hmm. I find that that creates a defensive question. It's, it's not a good question. And so I like to substitute, and, and I uh, learned this recently, not original with me, instead of, Donna, why did you do that? Use what or how. Uh, Donna, what made you come to that decision? Or Donna, how did you come to that decision? Mm -hmm. It, it, and again, I'm curious, Donna, how did you come to that decision instead of why did you do that? But why is a great question if I'm asking Donna about a situation. Donna, why do you think that happened? In other words, it's not something where, I, where you feel painted into a corner, but why do you think that happened? Or why do you even think she did that or said that or he did that? Um, it's just been helpful for me to, to begin to use how or what if I'm asking the question of the person in front of me and then use why more about situations or other people. Or, or again, there's the benefit of asking why six times mm -hmm. to get to the root cause. So why can be a great question. It can also be a not so good question. I love that you've teased that apart, Bob. So that's a really helpful learning point there. That why, when point when directed at someone personally, is what creates defensiveness. But why pointed toward a situation, or uh, I work a lot in the context of creating organizational and transformational change. Why is it a really important question for leaders to be answering um, about change and so on? So why pointed at a situation, totally appropriate. 
why pointed at a person creates defensiveness. Fantastic. All right, so we're talking about leadership effectiveness here. And these are three ways that questions increase that effectiveness. So we talked at the very beginning, Bob, you shared the story about the rowboat and by all team members rowing together, by all team members sharing what they know, then a leader is going to get better information because they ask questions rather than make assumptions. And yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, when I think about growing your team and improving your culture, um, I'm just looking at a, benefit, a list of benefits in leading with questions and, and asking questions. Your staff will grow more. Uh, it's going to be easier for them to implement the solutions they come up with. Uh, their self-confidence grows when, when they share an idea and you say, wow, great idea. Let's go with that. Their self-confidence grows. And as you lead with questions, rather than giving them solutions, uh, they're more likely to solve the next problem they encounter without your assistance. Mm -hmm. and, and then, Donna, when I think about, again, growing a team, improving a culture, is that when you lead with questions, you're developing leaders, not followers. Yes. If you solve every problem a staff member comes to you, now some will keep coming. But in other words, it's like every day they got to come to you to get a fish. And instead of you teaching them to fish so that they can solve their own problems, and consequently, instead of developing a follower, you're developing another leader. And of course, your organization can't grow any faster than your ability to develop leaders. And so when you lead with questions, you are developing leaders, which will allow your organization to grow. You know, individuals to grow themselves, but then the team to grow. And, uh, and then this culture of, of uh, so many things, the, the culture in which staff feel valued. They feel that their input is, is uh, wanted, needed, that, uh, that they have the brilliance to actually solve problems. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of place all of us would like to work at or stay at if that's what we're experiencing. And so uh, lots of benefits here. I mean, thanks for, for this list and for just pointing out uh, how they increase your leadership effectiveness. Absolutely, Bob. And this is really interesting because uh, Scott, a lot of the work Scott and I do connects to culture and we go in and we are measuring culture and we'll talk with leaders and they'll say, oh my goodness, you know, uh, why, can't, why aren't people answering their own questions? Why do they keep bringing me questions, right? It, and so one of the things, what you just pointed out is when you answer questions, when you're the one that's solving the problems in the organization, as a leader, you build dependency on yourself. And what you're suggesting is that by leading with questions, you're actually creating, you're growing your team and you're improving your culture because you're um, removing that dependence on yourself as a leader. So you're growing leaders, not just solving the problems and not just improving everyone else's ideas. Exactly, exactly. And one of the things I wanted to connect into in terms of better information in today's world, you know, we keep hearing about the VUCA world and how there's incredible amounts of change taking place. And one leader cannot, in and of himself or herself, know everything that's going on. And we hear um, oftentimes in culture, um, companies are saying, we want a more agile organization or we want a more innovative organization. And to me, questions are the way to make that happen. Because the more leaders ask questions, the more they're gathering the information they need to be responsive and agile. And the more they're demonstrating to their teams, to their um, people, about how important their input is. And when everyone's input is valued, that's when you can create innovation and creativity and really start living in a more agile environment versus just giving it lip service. So for all those reasons, we could probably um, talk for the next half an hour on um, how all of those things connect into questions. Donna, uh, 
I have several quotes on my wall that constantly remind me of things. And one is from Dr. Henry Cloud. He says, when you give advice, the brain is basically asleep. If you engage them and ask questions that help them come to their own insights, it, meaning the brain, comes alive. Mm. And, and think about, so connecting that to organizations, how much productive potential exists in each of the team members within that organization that can be harnessed, if you will, or brought into um, greater levels of productivity for the organization by asking questions, right? Bring, uh, awakening the brain and bringing it to life. Donna, I have another thought here, an additional thought on, on ways questions can increase your leadership effectiveness. Uh, this may be a bit counterintuitive, but Donna, if you're going to lead with questions, if you're going to ask your staff questions, what do you need to do every time you ask a question? Oh, I'm thinking that there's another important part in communication that you're not just asking, maybe you need to listen. Yeah, yeah. In fact, if you're not going to listen, there is no point. Well, it, 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 you do not help yourself by asking questions and then not listen. If you're mm -hmm. perceived as, yeah, Bob asked the question, but he never really listens. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not actually going to continue to answer if that's the feeling. And um, there's a, a statement that's also on my wall, another quote by David Augsburger. He says, being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. And I'll read that again. Being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. Mm. You know, Donna, in most professional settings, it, it, it isn't appropriate to say to, uh, you know, like one-on-one -on -one with a staff member, I love you. Mm -hmm. But when you listen to them, they feel loved. And, uh, and so improving our listening skills is actually another way to increase leadership effectiveness. And uh, one of the things, Donna, have you, have you ever gone to a rodeo and saw bull riding? Mm -hmm. uh, I think I've seen it on television, Bob. Okay. <laughs> Do you recall how long a bull rider has to stay on the bull in order to get a, a qualified ride? I don't, but I can't imagine it's more than a few seconds. Well, it's eight seconds. Okay. Eight seconds. And in bull riding, when you watch it on TV or, or they're live, or to the bull rider probably, the eight seconds seems like an eternity. And I mean, it's only eight seconds. But here's something fascinating. When we ask a question, on average, most of us, again, it's unconscious, we only wait two or three seconds for an answer. And if whoever we've asked the question doesn't answer in two or three seconds, most of us will either restate the question, ask a different question, answer the question ourselves, or just move on. And we have no awareness that we've done that. And so uh, I've adopted, and again, not original with me, I've adopted the eight second rule. And just like for a bull rider seeming like an eternity, when you ask a question, and then count silently to yourself, 1,001, 1,002, all the way to eight. It also seems like an eternity. <laughs> but what I've found is that if you will wait, they will answer. And sometimes the longer the wait, the better the answer. And, and again, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, uh, you know, where's the restroom? And yeah, everybody can, gener you know, if it's their building, can answer that immediately. But Donna, if I was to say, Donna, what would you consider the three greatest leadership lessons you've ever learned? Unless you, you know, have asked that question of yourself and written an answer, I'm guessing, Donna, that I ought to give you more than two or three seconds. And if I will sit patiently and wait, I'm going to hear a fantastic answer, but I may need to give you eight, nine, 10, even 20 seconds before you start speaking, and then I will benefit from that. So um, at any rate, listening skills are absolutely needed. 
And uh, I'm hoping uh, those uh, participating today, just the eight second rule will be a helpful tip. Yes, and I wanna build on that. So it connects beautifully into our next slide, which is around the seven C's of the art of inquiry and also connects to what John Hackett was sharing that listening is important, but listening Done. and then being quiet. Okay. And, and I say that because how many times do people listen with the intent of responding versus listening with the intent of hearing? And that's very different. And it's interesting as I've challenged leaders with that, you know, are you, are you listening? You can be quiet, but are you listening because you're waiting to respond? Or are you listening because you truly want to understand? Donna, that, that reminds me of something. Um, a while back on my blog, uh, somebody did the, uh, the blog was, was asking the second question. And, and the point was, he's kind of said, any fool can ask the first question. But asking the second question, and, and just an example, um, a friend came up to him and said, hey, what you been up to? And he said, I just finished an interview and he named the person. And instead of saying, wow, what did you learn from that person? They changed the topic and went somewhere else. And, uh, and so one of the things I find is that as I listen, rather than how to respond, I, I listen to ask, you know, a follow-up question that relates to what they're sharing. And, uh, and if I can't think of one, I can always use the question many of our, our participants today suggested. Donna, t can you tell me more about mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. But uh, at any rate, focusing on asking a follow-up, a second question versus uh, me responding. And in fact, Donna, th there's another thing. Unconsciously, I don't know why we're this way. But uh, Donna, let me just demonstrate something. Uh, where did you and Scott go on your last vacation, Donna? Well, we just got back from wine country, California. Now, Donna, if I'm really a good listener, I would say, hey, tell me more about that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and continue to go down that path. But there's something within us at times that says, oh, Donna, man, let me tell you about my trip there. Yes. And, and we hide, what I call, we hijack the conversation. <laughs> so true. <laughs> and we tell them all about our trip. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they're thinking, I thought Bob wanted to know about my vacation, but I guess he wanted to tell me about his vacation. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's absolutely true. So we're, we're emphasizing then um, the importance of listening and as in the listening, you know, Bob, we've illustrated a lot of these different uh, C's that are on the slide here. So being curious, which is what you're saying, instead of listening to respond, you're being curious and you're prepared on clarifying by following up with another question. And I love that you shared that because it gets back to um, having a new cue, right? So whenever I'm trying to learn something new, um, I try to cue myself. So what you just shared with us is a great cue that when I ask a question, listen for the next question I'm going to ask, right? So that's my cue versus listening and trying to speak so that I help the person understand I really listened well. Meanwhile, they just really want to talk. So that's a great cue. And then another part in listening is um, doing so without judgment. Right, so really maintaining an open mind and hearing what people say, because so many times, um, you know, you you illustrated how people can listen and then respond with their redirecting it in their own way, but people can also listen and make an automatic assumption versus exploring to try to understand what what was meant by the response to their question. Yeah, Donna. Um... Again, the question, uh, please tell me more. There's times when we're listening, we may actually be getting uh, criticism. Somebody's criticizing us. And Donna, I don't know about you, but when I'm criticized, my, my natural instinct is to defend myself. <laughs> um, but that generally doesn't actually uh, work so well. And a much better question is, Donna, you know, you give me some 
criticism and instead of defending, Donna, could you say more about that? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more? It's the tell me more question. And, uh, and, and let them talk more because you don't actually need to make a defense of yourself. But, uh, but as they tell you more, you might actually discover, huh, and, and you can, Donna, thank you. That was really helpful. Um, but um, again, listening without judgment, because especially if it's criticism of us, it's really easy to instantly react instead of respond with, uh, yeah, we, the judgment is you're wrong. I'm not that way. <laughs> really good. Yes. So I like, again, the please tell me more. I find that helpful because sometimes I, as I'm listening in people's response, I haven't even had a chance to formulate the next question. So that's also an excellent cue for all of you listening. Keep that tucked away that when people share anything, the please tell me more almost gives them permission to share what they really wanted to say. Because sometimes I don't have you experienced this, Bob, where people will give you an answer and they're almost like, do you really want to know or are you just being polite? Sure. And and, uh, you know, and a great opportunity for us to say, hey, I need to hear more. Please, please, uh, please keep talking. Definitely. So some of the other C's that I wanted to touch on is um, it, emphasizing what Bob's shared already in terms of being comfortable with silence. Uh, it's something that doesn't exist much in our society today. We're constantly filled with noise and it feels like, you know, the minute somebody says something, someone else is jumping into a conversation. And so being comfortable with silence is, um, is, a, is a skill that you have to develop. Any tips on that, Bob? Well, again, the, uh, I have an acrostic at my desk. It's WAIT, W-A-I-T, but the words are why am I talking? And uh, it, it reminds me to, uh, to be silent, to listen. Um, I'm also thinking there's, there's another aspect. I, I read this about Mike Wallace. Mike has passed, but he was the famous uh, investigative reporter at 60 Minutes. And he used silence, he said, in another way. Certainly you ask a question and remain silent. But he would ask a question and they would speak. And when they got done, instead of jumping into the silence with the next question or making a comment, he would just remain silent. And he said after two or three seconds, they got a little uncomfortable and they said more. Mm. Now you might say he was doing that. You could, you could say that could be a manipulation. I, I would grant that to somebody. But I think when you're genuinely curious, you're, you're not an investigative reporter. Uh, using silence to, uh, in other words, a pause, they're thinking what else to say and just remain silent. The silence itself is the form of another question. Very true. Very true. Anything else you'd like to comment on, Bob, in the seven C's of the art of inquiry? Anything that catches your attention? I think we've captured it. Uh, maybe our, uh, our participants have another thought on one of these words. Uh, and again, I, you know, this has gone fast. I'm, the fact that we're capturing the webinar chat is uh, I'm going to look forward to just digging in deep to learn from our participants on all the comments they are making here. Yes, F fabulous. And I appreciate all of the comments that you've all made. So, Bob, uh, I think it's time to transition into uh, some questions before we dive into the resources. So there's some folks that had questions. And one was, what have been some of the results of asking employees for their input, but never using it in your leadership and or the way forward? Um, Donna, I, I don't have this quote right in front of me. And so I can't give proper credit, which I would like to. And, uh, and it won't be word for word, but it went something like um, um, a leader who, who doesn't listen will soon be surrounded by, by a group of followers who have nothing to say. Mm. And, uh, 
And so I think it would be devastating. Well, th there's no point. You might as well be a leader who just tells than <laughs> pretending to ask and then the staff feeling like it had no effect whatsoever, ever. Mm -hmm. And um, and yet on the other end, Donna, you know, one of my favorite stories, something I love about leading with questions is so often the best questions are so simple. And I'm thinking of uh, Commander Michael D. Abershoff, who took over the command, uh, became the captain, uh, this quite a few years ago, of the U USS Benfold. It was then one of America's most modern warships. When he took over, the morale on that ship was the lowest in the Navy. 18 months later, the morale on that ship was the highest in the Navy. And the first thing Captain Abershoff did was he had 300 one-on-one, uh, -on -one, about 15-minute meetings. So this took, probably even a period of weeks. But when he got, had these one-on-one -on -one with 300 sailors on that ship, he just asked them three questions. The three questions were, what do you like best about this ship? What do you like least? What would you change if you could? Now, Donna, he didn't promise that he would change every single thing, but he quickly heard themes. And it didn't take long, and sailors saw changes being made as a result of their input. And, and of course, there was a buzz that took place on the ship at the end of the first day. You know, only a relative handful had actually been uh, sat down and spent that time with the captain. But the buzz on the ship was the new captain's different. He actually cares what we think. He's actually asking us questions and listening. And uh, Donna, I grew up on a farm in South Dakota. I do not consider myself to be a brilliant, brilliant person. So what I love about his three questions is I'm smart enough to ask those. Uh, I can memorize them. What do you like best? What do you like least? What would you change if you could? And they are simple and yet so powerful. Outstanding, Bob. And I, I want to emphasize what you were sharing about the importance of doing something so people definitely want to be heard but then you need to close the loop and sometimes you can't act on people's recommendations we, do, we find that a lot as we're doing um, work in organizations with culture where we're soliciting a lot of input and feedback but it's absolutely essential that if you're asking that you're willing to, you're willing to take action or at least respond about why you um, can't do something so I, I think that quote you shared was fantastic. Thank you. Well, Nathan Charles in the uh, chat just said that quote's from Andy Stanley. So thank you, Nathan. Oh, I terrific. believe you are, well, you are correct. I remember that now. Uh, Jim asks a question here. Uh, sometimes an employee might feel like you do not listen simply because you did not use the idea they provided in the answer to your question. How do you avoid this from happening? Um, Jim, just a couple of thoughts. Again, if we were having a conversation, I'd say, Jim, what do you think? And because uh, I'd be really curious on how, how you think we can avoid that from happening. Um, kind of in this one way, I think uh, expressing appreciation, in a sense, mirroring their answer and expressing appreciation for that uh, will be helpful. Um, it may not be perfect, but in my new book coming out, uh, Donna, there's, there's one section in which I talk about a decision-making process, and, and there's process A and there's process B, and they have the same three boxes. In decision-making A, leader makes decision, leader second box informs staff, leader three asks if there's any questions. In decision-making B process, leader asks staff that might be affected for their input. Leader makes decision, leader informs staff. And what's interesting is that if we're asked prior to the decision being made, the decision actually can be made opposite of what we suggested. And, and generally speaking, we will still support it because the leader asked us for our input prior to making the decision. Mm -hmm. 
And, and I found that fascinating. I, I don't want to say that's true 100% of the time. But generally speaking, because they respected us to ask for our input prior to the decision, we will actually are much more likely to support that than when they make the decision without even asking. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'd like to build on what you're sharing there, Bob, because um, another dimension of that is being clear on who is making the decision. So if somebody's asked for their input and they believe that their input is actually affecting the outcome of the decision, they can get frustrated. So I've experienced that in some organizations where people believe that everybody needs to buy in and 100% agree before a decision can move in a certain direction. So I think there's, it's a combination of getting input and being clear about who has decision authority. So am I gathering your input so that I can make a better decision or are we making the decision together? Great, great clarification, Donna. Excellent. So let's move on to a couple new questions. Um, tips for introverts at networking events. What are the best questions to ask that create connection? So um, Bob, I'll give you a second to think on that. And while you're considering it, I think you actually shared the what's your story is a great way, whatever context you're in, of getting deeper and having a more meaningful conversation uh, at a networking event than just what do you do? Donna, yeah, you're absolutely right. That is my uh, favorite go-to question whenever I'm meeting new people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the other thing I find about networking events and, um, uh, you know, and certainly there's all kinds of people there on the on the scale of extrovert to introvert. Uh, you know, it runs the whole scale, but almost everybody appreciates somebody else taking the initiative to say hi. And so, uh, you know, I don't know why we're wired in some ways, like they probably don't want to get to know me, so I'll just stand over here in the corner. But uh, but I find that just taking the initiative to walk up and, and say, hi, my name's Bob. And they say, you know, my name's Donna. Donna, I, you know, love just to hear your story. And, and you lean in with interest and curiosity and, and they start talking. And the result is you're making a new friend, a new acquaintance. It mm -hmm. questions build relationship. And the fact that you were interested enough to ask and then to listen um, is just a great way to connect. Yes. And then, of course, in hearing their story, uh, the, the second and third questions often will come. They might say, you know, every story would be different, you know, uh, grew up in a home where my dad was a policeman. And uh, yeah, I went to Auburn University and I'm married now, and we've got identical twin daughters. Well, they've given you so many clues for a second question, like, well, what was it like growing up with a, with a dad who was a policeman? Mm -hmm. How'd you happen to go to Auburn University? How did you choose Auburn? What's it like to have twin daughters? What, I mean, what are the blessings and what are the challenges? And, uh, you know, those are the three follow up our low, low hanging fruit. It didn't take brilliance on my part to come up with those. But you hear a story and, and there will be clues for that second and third question in their story. And, uh, and now you've connected. And, and then I always tell people, be prepared, because so many times people will parrot the question you just asked. Bob, tell me your story. And, uh, and so, in fact, uh, there's another, I don't know if this is manipulation, but if you want somebody to ask for your business card, say, Donna, do you have a business card? <laughs> and Donna pulls out her business card and almost always will say, well, Bob, do you have a business card? Instead of walking up and saying, well, Donna, I want you to have my business card. It's uh, maybe that's manipulation, but it's a curious thing. Whatever question you ask often will be asked of you. So mm -hmm. kind of in your mind, be prepared to answer your question. Yeah, that's great, Bob. One of the favorite ones I like to ask um, is, you know, what's the most fascinating or interesting thing you've discovered or learned over the last week, couple of weeks? You know, you can set the context for it. But as you said, you need to be prepared to answer it. So yeah. um, whatever that is, it's, um, 
I, I find collecting questions helps. And then I usually prepare before going into a networking event. What's the one or two questions I want to stay focused on so that I can have more interesting, meaningful conversations, as you pointed out. Yeah. So a couple other questions, and then we're going to move into resources. Um, Jack said, one aspect of asking questions that wasn't covered yet is the timing of asking questions. Isn't that often important? So I want to reflect back on the seven C's that yes, um, the third one is being conscious of your timing when you're asking the question, and then connected to that pretty closely is choosing your context. So there's some, sometimes questions are not appropriate. <laughs> so we need to be careful of our timing and our context. Anything you want to add to that, Bob? It's, um, I don't have a definitive answer. I, I absolutely agree. And it's, it's, you know, maybe it's in my unconscious mind, but, you know, there are times to ask and there's times not to. Uh, oh, this triggers one thought. You know, there are some times we're in a meeting and, uh, or maybe one-on-one -on -one or a coaching session and we're kind of conscious of the time and we think, oh, I wish, I, I wish there was time to ask this one more question, but nope, there's not time. So we choose not to. I've learned something and that is sometimes we can say, you know, Donna, uh, our time is just about up. Um, I've got another question I want to ask, but there won't be time for us to discuss it. But let me just ask the question. And next time we're together, I'd love to hear your answer. Hmm. And so you ask that question. And, um, and again, it, it, it'd be an appropriate question for that kind of context. And what's really amazing is that people actually will keep thinking about that. And when you get together next time, they will generally have an answer. And uh, so there are times you can ask that one more question by just planning it for the next conversation. Well, that's uh, a great tip, Bob. I like that. All right. So timing, yes, it does matter. And then Elga had a question about what do you do when a team member acts negatively when you ask questions of what they think or asks for input? So um, I guess whenever there can be times where you're asking questions out of curiosity and the best intent and people respond negatively. So any thoughts on how to handle that? You know, I've certainly have experienced that. It, it's not often, but I like to to, um, and I don't. I, I have a thought here. I don't want to suggest. Okay, I have the answer to this. <laughs> uh, I don't. I'd love to have others respond on how they might handle that. Um, but when you sense that, uh, pausing, leaning in, and and. Um, you know, just saying, you know, I'm, I'm curious. Um, it, it, it seems like as I've asked this, this has created a bit of awkwardness. Are, are you feeling that? Okay. And, That's great. Uh, and kind of going to the feeling part mm -hmm. and, uh, and just the chance and, and, you know, maybe they say, well, yeah, I feel like you're judging me for my answers. And it allows you to say, oh, please, yeah, please. I, I, if it's come across that way, I, I want to apologize. I really wanted to learn from you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really value that. And then I think there's another thing. If a leader has been a teller like I was, and suddenly you've read the book, you've listened to this seminar, and so you go back this afternoon and you start just asking questions, <laughs> um, it may be so out of context of how they've previously experienced you that it may take a while. They may think, what is she doing? Is this a trick? Uh, you know, and that. And so I think there's sometimes we have to say, you know, I'm trying to develop a new habit here. I've always led. I've seen the value. I'm trying to do this. Uh, you're going to have to help me. And, uh, and, and kind of going down that path. Mm -hmm. Great, great response there, Bob. So in our last few minutes, I wanna share a couple resources for everybody on the phone. And again, we're gonna send you links to everything so you don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, am I gonna remember these or not? The first is books. So um, the, the book listed on the upper 
left hand leading with questions is the one that Bob mentioned changed his life. Uh, Power Questions is written by our friend and colleague, Andrew, and an excellent book as well. And then Warren Berger's book, A More Beautiful Question, I think is an absolutely fabulous book. Now, two books that nobody here has read because they were actually not released yet are a new one from Warren Berger on the, the book of beautiful questions and how Gar Gregerson questions are the answer. Um, so excellent resources, uh, pay attention. And of course, Bob's new book is coming out as well. So don't miss that. We'll make sure everybody gets a link to it. Um, in the chat for all of you who are still out there, tell us what's your favorite question resources? What have you found helpful and useful? And we're gonna walk through um, a couple other points. So Bob has available for everyone on this webinar, everyone who is listening in after the webinar together, um, go to leadingwithquestions.com, sign up, you'll get an amazing, and Bob, I love the regular posts that you share from all of your guest posters. Um, fascinating, fantastic information on questions. So you'll get access to that as well as those resources. Anything else you want to say about that? Well, Donna, obviously uh, we've communicated today in English, but uh, some of the participants may be part of global companies or may have uh, friends, colleagues uh, in other parts of the world. And uh, Great Leaders Ask Questions has been translated into Spanish. It's also available as a free uh, Spanish MP3, as well as the English version is available. I read the book, uh, an MP3. Mm -hmm. It's also been translated into uh, Chinese. And uh, Chinese, now there, there's, there's traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese. Simplified is used in mainland China and uh, traditional Chinese, more like Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, places like that, but they're available and all free. So in other words, if you have colleagues in those parts of the world that either Spanish or Chinese is their first language, uh, they may really appreciate that. And, uh, and then coming up, French is almost ready to be released. All right. And so again, all of these are available for free. And uh, my whole goal, what excites me, is helping leaders become more effective from moving from the burden of feeling like they need to have all the answers to simply knowing some of the questions. Fantastic. Um, in addition, um, with Brighton Leadership Group, we've got a ton of free stuff out there for all of you, from the Culturally Intelligent eBook to the Change Leader Toolkit. You can download that, Five Culture Activators, uh, and a ton of other resources. And of course, the Leadership Catalyst Question Cards. So um, if you want to learn more information, check out our website, Brighton Leadership. Under the tips and tools, you'll see a link to question cards, and you will find out more about those. Send us an email, let us know you're interested, and we'd be happy to share more about them. And also the link for that is in the chat box as well. Yeah, so. I, and I just want to encourage people to get the cards. Donna, uh, we took care of that yesterday for me. Mine are on the way. I can yes. hardly wait to uh, get them. Absolutely. Thanks, Bob. So the actions for everyone, sign up for Bob's email, download the book on asking questions. And I'm sure that when you do that, you'll also be getting information about the upcoming book. Um, we'd love for you to sign up for Tuesday's Tremendous Tip, where you get weekly insight and information. Get yourself a deck of Catalyst question cards. And then last but not least, how do you pull all the information in this webinar together? Um, our recommended action plan for each of you on the call, collect questions. So start today, all the wonderful questions, we'll be sharing more out with you. Then customize a queue just for you so that you can increase the number of questions. Um, you're asking them more often, so your question to telling ratio gets better. And by asking more questions, you increase your effectiveness in life, in leadership, and every other way. So thank you so very much. Bob, any closing words? Well, Donna, thank you. You've asked terrific questions today. And, and thank all of those who uh, participated. And uh, again, Donna, I am looking forward to, uh, to learning from our participants as I have a chance to actually read every word, <laughs> every question they've contributed today. Uh, but this has been a pleasure. Lots of fun. 
Likewise, thank you for all who stayed on to the very end. We appreciate your participation. Again, you're gonna receive a copy of the recording, a copy of the slides, the chat, all the resources. So you will have lots of fantastic information and we appreciate all of you um, and your participation in the chat. So we'll, as Bob said, learn from you. In the meantime, have a terrific rest of your Tuesday and we look forward to you joining us on a future webinar and downloading all the resources we mentioned. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.